mailbag. That's the nothing personal word of the day. Today is Monday. Guess what? Yesterday, I ran the London Marathon. I'm coming to you not live because I may be prone, unable to walk. I wanted to do a mailbag because I don't get to do enough of them. And this is the first mailbag on the DraftKings network. So a mailbag episode is when you ask me questions. We do it on regular episodes, so you want to talk to Samson. But there's so many that we get that we dedicated episodes to questions that come in on Twitter at David P. Sampson. They come in on davidsampsonpodcast.com, which is our website. Sometimes on Instagram at David P. Sampson. And there's so many great ones that we want to give you a full show on it. So get ready. Number one, we got to start. David. Hi. You are running the London Marathon. That's true. I want to do a marathon. How do I start? Please help me. I would say if I had a rank, I was thinking about this and preparing. So this is not being taped today. And I don't want to bring you to inside baseball, but the marathon was yesterday, but I'm running it in just a couple of days. So I'm sitting here a little bit nervous thinking about how I didn't prepare as much as I should have due to laziness, not due to schedule. You have time to do anything you want in a day. I never liked when employees said to me, oh, I didn't have time to do that. Or my kids, did you get your homework done? No, I didn't have time to do that. Of course you had time. You just didn't choose to use your time to accomplish that task. Marathon running is for anybody. I don't care if you have a bad knee, a bad back, a bad hip, a bad flexor, a bad shoulder, a bad brain. All it takes is discipline and all it takes is the ability to overcome mental and physical fatigue. That's pretty much it. Now, I'm not trying to run a three hour marathon. I'm trying to run a seven hour marathon. I started, let's go back to the beginning. The marathon journey started back in 1996 with the New York marathon. And you know how I first started? I couldn't run even a mile. I started on a bet. It was not listed on DraftKings, but maybe it should be. And the market was, can you run around the reservoir in New York City? And my answer was, of course. And I couldn't. So finishing that one lap around the reservoir where I could barely walk and couldn't jog the whole thing, someone said to me, I bet you can't do the marathon. I said, you mean the New York marathon? When is it? November. It's March. Wait a minute. That's eight months. I'll do the marathon. And they bet me. And that was it. I've got that sort of thing. I don't like losing. It's the competitive juice. And the first thing I did was go to halhigdon.com. He's still around. That's the website where you get a training program. If you follow a training program all the way through, you will get to the finish line. The hardest part about doing a marathon is getting to the start line. Getting to the start line without being hurt, hard to do. But once you're at the start line, they talk to you about what it takes to finish. It takes telling yourself you're just going to keep going. It takes your brain telling your body when it can't move anymore, keep going. It takes your body telling your brain when your brain says stop because this is bad for me. It's your body that just keeps going. That's the training part. What you're training for when you train for a marathon is for your body to ignore your brain. It's such an important part of life. What we do for living here on Nothing Personal, and I've said this as part of the live tour that we've done in, in several of the cities, is that one of the things that I love is that my mouth is always behind my brain. So I always know what I'm saying before I say it. Like I knew I was just going to say that before I said it takes training. It takes practice. When you're in the middle of a marathon, they call it the wall around mile 19, mile 20, but that's a bunch of horse hockey. It can happen at mile four. It can happen at mile nine. It can happen at mile 20. It can happen at mile 25. Side note, I ran a marathon once with my cousin. He collapsed at the finish line. 
he had a he had to crawl across the finish line because his legs gave out with like 10 yards to go. So it can happen anytime. But what the training does is it teaches your body to ignore the brain because in training it's just re it's reps. It's 3 miles, 4 miles, 5 miles, then you build up and you have a weekend run of 10, then all of a sudden you run 12 and then 18. And then you get through the training program and you know that your body's ready. So what is the thing that worries me the most about London? Well, if we've got a mailbag episode tomorrow as well, then you'll know that maybe there'll be no more live episodes. But what worries me the most is that I haven't earned the starting line. And what that means is I haven't done enough training in order to deserve to run this marathon. And the reason I haven't done enough training, A, is laziness, and B, my brain telling my body that you ran seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. You didn't need recovery from a marathon. You just did another marathon. But the problem is the training I did for that back in 2017 to run that in 2018 was tremendous. So my advice to you, and this goes for marathon running, and this also goes for business, it goes for everything. You're asking how you start with one step. It's the hardest step you'll take. I put a tattoo, I can't show it now because I'm not flexible enough. I have souvenez-vous demain. That means remember tomorrow. When you're training for a marathon, it's so important to remember tomorrow because if you don't do the workout you're supposed to do, you wake up the next morning feeling like crap. You didn't remember tomorrow. It's going to be fascinating to see whether or not you do start. Did you watch any part of the Boston Marathon, which just happened last week? My friend Dave McGilvery, who was a guest on the Boston Nothing Personal Live show, he's been the race director for decades. He's been running the marathon for 52 straight years. People commonly want to know what is different about those of us who run and are you going to change if you start training? Are you going to become like one of those CrossFit people where you become like you think it's cult-like? And the answer is if you remember tomorrow and you're disciplined and you're a part of something and you feel the accomplishment of your first finish line, whether it's a 5K, a 10K, it's like when you have a good meeting at work. It's like when you meet someone for the first time when you're out at a bar and you see the fireworks, the feeling. You could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be at a bar. I don't know why I said that. It could be online. It's that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling of self-worth, that feeling that, look, I set a goal and I reached it. I was distracted, Coca, by a question that came up. People ask me a lot about Survivor. And the two most common questions I get about Survivor are, one, how did you get on the show? which always makes me laugh because I applied. How else do you get on the show? And two, where do you poop? Those are the two things people want to know. Like, are there bathrooms? And my answer is no, you actually go in the ocean and they call it an aqua dump. When it comes to marathons, several of the questions I get are, hey, how do you start? Which was your question. And what do you do if you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of a run? Well, Hi, my name is David Sampson. I've had to go to the bathroom during almost every show, <laughs> true story, and every long run. Do you know what you do? You drop trow and go to the bathroom. There are people who say, oh, I'm gonna go to the bathroom on myself while I run. Listen, unless you're getting paid to finish at a certain time, don't go to the bathroom on yourself. Side note, Coca, I violated that during the Ironman in 06. You're supposed to pee while you're on the bike because it means you're hydrated during an Ironman, which is a 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike, and then you run a marathon all in a row. And I did the Ironman in Hawaii, and you train for being able to go pee-pee while you're riding your bike because you don't have the time to get off your bike, go to the side of the road, go to the bathroom. And that requires an amazing amount of training 
and a working hose. When you're running, don't do that. So there's porta potties along the way, but I'm not a porta potty guy. So I tend to go behind the porta potties. Sounds crazy, but next time you see a marathon and you go behind at the porta potties, it's pretty private. Every long run, Coca. The other thing you have to train for when you ask me how do you start to train for a marathon, you also have to train your tummy and you have to practice. You have to practice things you eat before you run and how they react to you. There's some people who can only eat gels. There's some people who can only eat muffins. There's some people who like eating pizza, peanut butter. Everybody has a different stomach. And the only way is not by reading books. It's not by taking suggestions. It truly is by trial and error. So one of the little nuggets of fun information for you when you're doing your first long run, I wouldn't suggest going out and back away from your home. I would suggest doing multiple short loops so that you're never too far away from your home or apartment if possible, because when you're testing your tummy, you don't know when it will be necessary to stop. So I'm excited for the marathon. I'm actually excited to finish. I'm excited to go to London and be a part of that. It's, it's such a great family atmosphere when you're a part of a marathon and the feeling of finishing. And you may remember the last marathon I tried was in Berlin and I quit at mile 12 or 13 because I hadn't earned that starting line. So my mentality going into London is no matter what, I'm not quitting. If I start, I'm finishing. And the only reason I say if I start is I've got to get to London and I've got to make sure that I'm there before race time. But I fully expect to start. I fully expect to finish because I'll be incredibly embarrassed and disappointed if I don't. So we'll see. Although by now you will have seen what a weird concept, the mailbag pre-tape on the DraftKings network. It is NFL draft week. People get so excited. There's how much content is there on the NFL draft? You all ready? Mock drafts up the wazoo, figuring out who's going where, when, what number, what are the Bears doing? What are the Patriots doing? How many quarterbacks are going on top? GMs are leaking information out there right now with what they're doing, who they're looking at. When they give public interviews, they're saying, hey, you know, we're, we're still in that room. We're still working through the board. <laughs> they like to say this. This was always a good line. We're finalizing our draft board. Let me explain. It's total horse hockey. Every team's draft board is finished already. If they say it's not finished, they're trying to just bait and switch other teams. They're trying to game play. Believe me, the draft board's done. We had, in baseball, our draft board would be done well in advance. And our baseball people are always so loony about this. They, want, they were so secretive. God forbid anyone sees who we've got on the board with our 20th selection. Oh, my God. You're going to draft right ahead of us. And you're going to take John Cocktoast and our minor league system is going to be ruined. At least in football, it's a bigger deal where the players are expected to impact your team immediately. In baseball, you're 50-50 either way. You could draft David Samson, Matthew Coker, or Bryce Harper. It's the same 50-50 for all three of us. I mean, granted, I think Bryce Harper may have a better chance, but maybe not. But they'd be so secretive that they would be in a room and they'd make sure the windows were all blacked out. They had security outside the room. No cleaning people allowed inside. We'd have to clean up the room on our own. It's so crazy. You think the cleaning person walks in? Hey, do you think they call the cleaning person from the other teams? That would be funny. Hey, David. Guess what? The Marlins at the four hole, they're looking at Dr. Rosen Rosen. No way. Let me tell you what's happening here in Texas with the three pick. They were looking at Rosen Rosen <laughs> like we're curing cancer. I'm not trying to downplay it. There's a lot of content around it. Metal Arc is going to talk about Metal Arc's going live. They're doing a watch party around the draft. Stu Gotts 
will go to Michigan purportedly for the draft. I don't believe that's why he's in Michigan, but he'll tell you. What's the drama around it? Is the drama on the actual pick? Why isn't the drama on the performance of the pick? How come we don't hear Coco? What was the, uh, Coco's with me on the mailbag. What was the name of the first pick? Was it Bryce Young? And he came out and was drafted by somebody and ended up not even having close to the type of season for the Panthers that is CJ Stroud did, as example. Yet when Bryce Young was drafted, when the Panthers had the first pick, it was all the rage. Who are they going to take? They take Bryce. Did they get it wrong? Did the Pelicans get it wrong taking Zion instead of John Morant? How many drafts do teams get wrong? This was really one I, to tell you because you people are all unrealistic, thinking that we're so good at what we do that we're going to bat a thousand in the draft. We're looking at players like you are now. You've got head coaches who are talking big games now in the NFL about all the tests that they do for their draft picks. We want good people. We want good players. I want good players and good people. Nah, you know what I want? I want to win. That's it. Find me a player who's going to help me win. I don't care what they get on the EQ test, the IQ test, the OA test. Doesn't make one bit of difference. You don't do well at the, what is it called, Coco, where we do Metal Arc and everybody else. When they're running the 40-yard dash, it's not the combine. Maybe it's the combine. Whatever it's called, where some of the players go, some of them don't go. The scouts are saying, oh, we're paying very close attention. We liked what we saw at the combine. When they're in that draft room, they're basing it on their scouting reports. They are getting confirmation bias at the combine either way. Oh, that's what we thought of that guy. Look at that. He's a step slow. Oh, him in the drills, him on the testing. No good. Well, you didn't like him to start with. Oh, we love this guy. Wait till you see him at the combine. Whoa. Was he the best? Like convincing ourselves that what we're doing is the right thing to do. It really is. I, I, I'm sorry to bring you inside the kimono so much, but you're going to see so much draft coverage, so many of these mock drafts and so many different iterations. All these front offices are trying to do is find the best player to help them win the most games. That's it. All this talk, well, are they going to do a wide receiver? Maybe they let the Cowboys, Stephen Jones, we let our center go. He's a Hall of Famer, but we had to move on. You know, maybe we'll take an offensive lineman, a guard, or a tackle. That'll help. I don't know. I'm cynical about it. Josh Harris is sitting there saying, hey, I've got the second overall pick. My team stinks. I guess I got to take another quarterback. Robert Kraft is saying in between bullets that he's firing at Bill Belichick, he's saying, hey, no more Bill, no more Tom. Should we take a quarterback? It's just funny. I wonder what Jim Harbaugh is doing right now. I was also thinking about him. Last week, you saw the news about University of Michigan. Last week, you saw Harbaugh did not get exonerated or punished, but the NCAA did punish Michigan for a bunch of violations that were all led by Harbaugh. Now Harbaugh is leading his own draft. He's with the Chargers, back in the NFL competing with his bro. I wonder if he's looking at the draft and saying, listen, I know college. I mean, I was in Michigan. Let me tell you, here's who we've got to pick. I like it when a coach would do that. We'd bring in a manager from another organization, bring in a baseball executive from another organization, and we would strip mine them, search them in every crevice for any bit of information about another organization. That's one of the reasons why you hire someone is A, they're good, but B, oh, you're coming from the Rays? Tell me how they do it. Do it this way. The Red Sox did it with Chaim Bloom, ended up firing him. The Marlins are doing it with Peter Bendix, took him from the Rays. God knows if that'll work out. But even on lower levels than GM, you're bringing people in to learn. I wonder whether Jim Harbaugh walked into the Chargers and said, listen, A, I want to run the whole show, A, that's A. But B, let me tell you a little bit about the college game. Let me tell you how to skirt some rules. Let me tell you about Ann Arbor. It's just like 
Los Angeles. <laughs> I'm going to record something right now. This is a live read. Here it goes. Hi, this is David Sampson. Nothing personal with David Sampson and Matthew Coca brought to you each day, 8 a.m. live on YouTube and 10 a.m. on DraftKings. We have discovered a source within football that is indicating to us that Caleb Williams will be drafted first by the Chicago Bears. We also have information that the Washington Commanders will be making the second overall pick. Upon information and belief, we know it to be true now that the New England Patriots, 4869, that the New England Patriots will draft third. You know what? That makes us know as much as the next guy. But everyone's a genius when it comes to the draft. I don't even know why we're talking about that. It wasn't even a question. Hi, David. I have a question. Oh, well, this is the right form then. How are beat reporters treated by the clubs? You've spoken about MLB.com reporters working for the team, but what about the Miami Herald? I wonder if you're from Florida or other papers, ESPN or The Athletic. How much influence does the team have over what they say? I really wanted to talk about this on the show. I've taken the time to try to bring you inside a clubhouse, inside the front office. Sometimes to the discomfort of our producer, Matthew Coca, the esteemed Matthew Coca. But I got to do it again right now. Before the internet and social media was a real thing, before we thought about it as a way to disseminate information, newspapers were it. Radio, two minutes on your local evening telecast, your local evening news on television. But newspapers, they were the end all be all. Newspapers would assign a person called the beat writer to be around your club every day, all day. Get to the ballpark around three o'clock. They've got a schedule. They meet with the manager. Then they watch batting practice. They speak to players. When the game ends, they come to the clubhouse. They interview the manager and they interview players that were germane to that day's result. During the game, beat writers are all writing the article that they're going to release once the game is over. So as plays develop, as the game develops, they're writing things that happened. And if more happens late in the game, it just serves to delete what they talked about that happened early in the game. They make editing decisions if there's a lot of excitement. If there's not a lot of excitement, they're done with the story in the seventh inning where they've done a game story that gets released and given to the paper. What they add later, now that there's social media, are quotes that they get from the manager or players. But back in the day when there were newspapers, they'd have their article written, then they would go into the clubhouse, get interviews, then they'd have to run out of the clubhouse and they would have to dictate to a producer in studio what they just heard and where to put that into the story. Then there was a cutoff to when you could no longer get in tomorrow's paper because they had to go to print. So anytime there was a bad rain delays in Miami or a huge extra inning games before the online situation, you had pressure that I felt as team president on behalf of our PR people, hey, we got to get this game over or else tonight's game will not be a part of tomorrow's paper. And we were all used to that for West Coast games, but not for games in your time zone. So you'd go look at box scores in a paper and it would say, Suns at Lakers night. Even though the game already happened, there'd be no way to know what the score was, short of calling 976-1313. So these beat writers are a part of your team. We allow them on the team plane. They sit in their own section on the team plane. There's one rule that you have to have with beat writers, and it's a very important rule, and they never break it. The rule is you cannot write about what you hear or see on the team plane. Hard stop. 
And believe me, they hear a lot and see a lot. Having been a connoisseur of team planes for 18 years, I can tell you it's sort of like the bus going to high school. There's a lot going on if you pay attention, or you can put your headphones on and ignore the whole thing. But if you choose not to, you may get yourself into some trouble, or at least learn a few things. But the beat writers know they can't do that. The players know they won't do that, so the players are able to be themselves. The problem we run into with beat reporters is when there's a confusion with the player, because it's never the beat reporter, they have on the record and off the record as very clearly delineated. If you are going to be off the record, it has to be specifically stated, we are off the record. Otherwise, otherwise it is assumed that you are on the record, totally and completely. So the B writers become a part of your family, they travel with you. And there were, I don't know, 300 times in 18 years, twice a year for sure. So that'd be 318 years times two. So 36 times, it's gotta be way more than that. Way in the hundreds, so it's way more than twice a year where you want a beat writer to cover something that they're not covering, where you leak information to the beat reporter about a signing or about a trade and the quid pro quo, cause that's how it works. You give, you get, you get, you have to give. The quid pro quo is give me the information first, as an example, and I won't talk about X. You want me to withhold what I know about Y? Then you better give me Z, and I mean with the lead time that I'm going to scoop all my other beat writers. So it's a constant juggling match dealing with them. But only one beat writer is in the worst position of them all. And that is the beat writer who is employed by MLD, MLB.com. MLB.com is a website, obviously, started by Major League Baseball owners. MLBAM, Major League Baseball Advanced Media, oversees it. But it is owned 1 30th by each club. And owners view MLB Network also club owned, they view it as their asset. Except it is the one example where brilliant billionaire business minds are absolutely clueless and absolutely insecure in a way that you wouldn't even dream. Wow, these guys must have it all. Meanwhile, they're bags of nerves who don't like leaving their house. You wouldn't trade your life for theirs no matter how much debt you're in. And when owners see something on MLB Network or when they read something that the beat writer has said and it's negative, they feel as though they've got the right to call that in. They call it in two ways. One, you call the commissioner's office and say, hey, control MLB Network. And two, you call the reporter. It was always very popular for me when our owner would ask our head of comms, PJ Loyola, PJ, get him on the phone, find out why the hell he's writing that. PJ, find out why he's not writing this, but is writing that. Tell him he's not being fair. Tell him he's not welcome here anymore. Well, I got you all up until that point. We can't tell him he's not welcome. We have signed an agreement with baseball that beat reporters get the following rights and that MLBAM, MLB.com reporters have those same rights as the Herald. Doesn't make a difference where they're from, except they're not truly independent. Because for the number of times that I complain about things that are happening with ML BAM, with local writers, it's so tiny compared to the number of times that they have to get scooped and that they can't be first to market with stuff because of their relationship with baseball or when they can't be honest the way the Herald can be honest, MLB.com, they're never going to have written an article that Samson's the worst president of all time. It just wouldn't happen. The Herald can do it. The Sun Sentinel, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, doesn't matter. That's what newspapers are supposed to be about. 
is the honest dissemination of information where you can then make your choice. Hey, let me read about Samson. Is he really that bad? Nah, I just met him. He's not that bad. I get that all the time. Hey, he's really he's actually totally normal. We really don't have influence. Man, do we try. Hey, please write this. Don't write that. It doesn't work well. It simply doesn't. Okay. Hello from Italy, David. Outstanding. Love your show. Even better. Do you think Boris clients might be more interested in extensions after this year? I'm sure Boris won't change his strategy. I was thinking about Chapman as a Giants fan. That's Matt Chapman. And if he has a good year and Alonzo, that's Pete Alonzo, under any scenario. Thank you. Sometimes we go through the mailbag questions and I'll say, ah, oh, I'll answer that, but I really don't want to. Yeah, I'm not going to answer that. When this one came up, hard stop, I'm answering. What forces you to change your actions? I'd like you to give that a moment's thought while we're here. I would argue that lack of desired result is and should be the number one thing that would lead you to change the way you act, to change the way you react, to change the way you proact. We're always consequentialists at the end where we can look back and say, ooh, that didn't work, or I'm doing everything exactly the same. What does it take in your mind to have the ability to be self-aware, to have the ability to understand that the way we've always done it is not the way we can continue to do it. To be aware if we're not gaining market share, we're losing market share. To be aware that I was the greatest of all time and now I'm average. To be aware that you provide content to nothing personal in a way that makes grown men blush. I don't view Scott Boris as having any self-awareness. And that manifests itself in several ways. Number one, and most importantly, it manifests itself in him calling these press conferences, whether it's at the winter meetings or the GM meetings or the all-star game, where he holds court with his own backdrop, giving you little rhyming haikus about nothing, trying to explain why his players are the difference makers for all these teams, and then telling you when they're not signed, hey, there's some irregularities in the market. I'm here to tell you today that his clients, notwithstanding Jordan Montgomery bailing on him already and joining Joe Wolf, we covered it on a previous Nothing Personal, but I'm here to say this is the year where Boris changes. And if he does, that means that his players will be more open to current day extensions than they've ever been because he had a very simple rule with his players. It's a rule that costs Jose Fernandez, his daughter and fiance, a lifetime worth of money. It is a rule that says, I will not allow my player to sign an extension unless you overpay my player. Simple rule. GMs may not want to get it. They may not understand it. They may not agree with it, but it has been the raison d'etre for Scotty. Pete Alonso's in a position, hey, I'm not negotiating right now. Don't want to sign a new deal. It's total horse hockey. If the Mets went to Pete Alonso right now with 500 million over 10 years, he would forget that he said he didn't want to negotiate. He'll forget that he didn't want to sign an extension as a Boris client, and he'll sign it immediately, sight unseen. Hey, tour the facilities? No, thanks. I'm good. I'm here already. A team may be tampering with Pete Alonzo while we speak. Did we really tamper? Yes, we did. What do you do when you're on a live show that's sort of live to tape because it's not Monday and I'm probably somewhere in bed right now? What do you do when you have to sneeze, Coco? We never covered this in any of our rehearsals. Do you just sneeze? Or do you put your finger on your mustache like you're playing a joke? Do you ever see those people who have the tattoos on their finger of a mustache and they put their finger above here and it's a 
It's the weirdest tattoo. I mean, I love you, Camille, but it's a weird tattoo. So what? Well, let's get back to the question. Let me talk about Boris and his strategy. Will it change? Will he allow players to sign extensions if they're not being overpaid? Guess what? I think this is it. I think you nailed it. I think this is the time where he sees the writing on the wall, that the days of the overpay are behind, that owners have gotten wise to the realities of the declining revenue, of the more concerning streams of revenue and their abilities to be growing at the rate that they've been growing since I started in the game that have somehow disappeared or gotten lower. Increasing at a decreasing rate is what they say on Wall Street. We expect revenues to increase, but at a decreasing rate. That means we had a 10% profit. Next year, it's going to be 7%. Still good, but less good. I always like saying that. Hey, I did well. I mean, not as well as I did last year, but it's still good. Hey, I finished the marathon. I got a worse time, but I still finished. And then you can blame it on the surroundings. You can blame it on the weather. Scott Boris can blame this past off season. He can blame it on irregular markets. He can blame it on owners after him. But God forbid he would ever admit that he overpromised his clients and then couldn't pull a rabbit out of a hat with some desperate owner. I mean, Chapman's a good one to talk about, but we could talk about Snell too. We could talk about Montgomery also. Frankly, you can talk about Bellinger if you want. These Boris clients who signed these short-term deals, wondering if the teams that didn't sign them to a long-term deal will look at performance over the first half of the season or after one season and say, oh, we were wrong. Now we see you. It's one of the great, great moments about free agency. There are some X factors in free agency, but generally the things that we got wrong was because of overpayment in years and dollars. Sometimes we signed players who we didn't know well, and they ended up to be turds. Sometimes we signed players that we didn't know what they'd be like, and they were amazing to live with, amazing in the clubhouse, amazing on the field. But it's super hard to have quality both on and off the field. And you certainly can't discover that in a half a season. You think Blake Snell's been with the Giants, two starts, giving it up terribly, but maybe three starts by now. And you think the Giants saying, oh, now we're going to give you five, 150. Our bad. Weren't ready before. Ready now. Ready, player one. It really is quite a significant amount of horse hockey. So I don't think that there will be a change, but I think there likely should be a change in how Boris acts. All right, what's the next topic? I did all right. Sorry, Coca. I don't want to do okay. I'm just going to do a pause. Hello from Italy, David. Oh, that was the last one. <laughs> Cut that. 4869. Love the show and the insight. Thank you. Question. Who decides when the team gets a new uniform design? What is the process and who gets final say in approving the design and logo? Thanks in advance. Well, thank you, uniforms. Don't think I've ever spoken about uniforms as much as I have recently. Incredibly bizarre to me. All of the insanity. Do you remember before the season started in baseball? The Players Union was up in arms over the new Nike Fanatics jerseys that they were see-through. It's outrageous. And then they people were sweating through their unis where the darks didn't match the grays, which didn't match the tops or the bottoms, a total cluster of bad PR. What do you think about them? Let me tell you how it works. The players union, the players, the owners, the executives, MLB, the commissioner's office, Everybody has seen and approved the uniform before you buy it. Everybody. There are no surprises. Oh, side note, there are samples. When we changed over to the Miami Marlins on 11-11-11, we had a full redesign, new logo, new unis. I wish we had a picture of those ready, Coke. I didn't know I was going to answer this. Although in a mailbag episode, I did. But I didn't know I was going to talk about the Marlins. We had the M, 
an amazing, colorful logo. MLB was very upset about it because it sold great, by the way. They were very upset about it because it was so hard to print and the colors end up being very hard to be repeated. Fast forward to today, side note, nothing personal. We developed this logo that has these amazing colors on it, yet when it gets reproduced, the colors all get screwed up because it's so hard to rinse and repeat multi-colored logos. Even when you've got the Pantone number, even when you have the exact file format that's needed, it is still hard to repeat. But the people who complain, what is it that you're upset about? You not like the City Connect jerseys? You're upset that they haven't been delivered on time? Do you long for the days when there was one home jersey, one away jersey, your fault? You keep buying them. Stop buying the new crap and we'll stop putting out the same crap. I want to say that more clearly, Coca. 128469. If you stop buying new uniforms, then we would stop producing new uniforms. Baseball, there's going to be they're going to be so unhappy that I just brought this up, aren't they, Coca? I'm sorry, but it's true. You can do a whole thing on social media about City Connect jerseys that you don't like and the juice is still worth the squeeze because you're buying it at retail outlets, you're buying it online. You'd think it would be enough. Now we do a hat for Father's Day, a hat for Mother's Day, a hat for Jackie Robinson Day, a hat for any day, new hat, alternate logos, alternate jerseys up the wazoo. All of it is for you. That's just the truth. The final say is always with the owner, but that's once the commissioner and his office signs off on. The process is that you start way in advance. I mean, way in advance. We get a questionnaire in baseball. Right now it is April of 2024. We get notification that by May 1st, you must submit any changes you want for the 2026 season. I remember when I first got to baseball, I saw that memo. I remember clear as day, I said to my assistant, her name used to be Monique, who I had before Beth, who Beth has been my assistant for over 20 years, but I loved Monique and still do. I said, hey, listen, that's a typo, right? I was new to the game. I was just starting. They want something about what we're doing in 2026. I can't even figure out how we're marketing 2024 right now. Yes, we've got the giveaway days done, but I'm still trying to sell tickets. You want me to think that far ahead? Yes. Why? Logo design, clearing of the logo. Not everybody goes to Mauritius to do a trademark. MLB has to clear all these trademarks. It is MLB who does it, by the way. Everyone criticizing John Fisher. It's not John Fisher who did the Las Vegas Athletics. MLB has an entire department that helps it and does it smart people when you're doing a logo and a logo design and a uniform design you get mock-ups you get samples you have legal letters about clearance about any risk to the completion of the trademark then all the stuff gets pre-made before it even gets unveiled because it has to get made and then distributed to the licensed retailers they then have a date. Hey, this goes live on 11, 11, 11. So on the 11th at 11 PM, let's say the retail stores, those that are open, depending on the part of the country or the excitement of the day in your town, they're available on the website. They're live. Do you know when something's on the website, like a piece of merch from David Samson podcast.com Coca has it available way before you can buy it way before you can see it because he's the administrator of the website. So when there's a new uniform, the actual design of the new uniform will be on your website before you even have a chance to know what happened. But it is such a long process because it goes through so many iterations, which leads me to always ask. It's the same thing I ask when there is a bad movie or a cringy commercial. How many approvals were needed 
to get to where we are today. How did this movie get made? Did someone watch this movie and say, wow, that's really good dialogue. Look at that action scene. Show me some skin over there. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's unreal. We would have a way to know our logos and our uniforms. Do you know that for the Mother's Day and Father's Day and MLB league-wide holidays, we get sent what our uniform and hat will be, and we've got like a day to comment, but really you don't comment. You just say, great, no problem. When you've been in the league for long enough, they actually consult you before they make the decision for you. I'm talking about for league-wide things. For individual jerseys and uniforms, the league is far more in a consulting than in a direct basis. Though they do have their own design department on top of that. Fanatics is really struggling, Coca, so badly. The CEO of, of Fanatics, he's that guy who does the white party in the Hamptons. His name is Michael Rubin. Fanatics, trying to get into gambling, trying to get into retail, the trading card business, trying to get into anything they can. What they're really trying to get into, code alert, spoiler alert, they're trying to get into your pants. Don't my pantalon. No, no, not like that. I'm talking about your money, your billfold. Fanatics has been dealing with the issues with the uniforms, trying to deflect, trying to impugn the credibility of other institutions who are in the, in the uh, uniform pipeline of information. Article just came out where Ruben said, hey, I work 18 and a half hours a day. Strike that. I work 18 hours a day, six and a half days a week. That's what's called a banker. <laughs> Working 18 hours. Let's do the math on that. If you wake up like I do at four, you work out, start working at six. 18 hours a day is 12 plus six. That means you're done at midnight. That's 18 hours. And then you've got to wake up at four. I guess you don't have to work out. You can wake up at 5.30. Or maybe it's just like me doesn't need or get more than two to three hours of sleep a night. And then Sundays, way to go. You only work nine hours instead of 18. Operation Hyperbole, which is partnered with Operation Narcissism. It's totally fine. Listen, I tell people when I'm working hard too, because I want them to understand that it's not that I'm blowing off their phone calls or blowing off their Zooms or blowing off their nights out. It's that, listen, I've got to do all these things for our show or for the other shows I do. Michael Rubin wants you to know, hey, I'm on this. I'm on this fanatics thing. Don't you worry. I understand the business side of this. I understand the emotional side of it. I am with you. And no one's working harder than I am to fix everything. When you buy a new uniform, are you upset about the material that it doesn't sweat moisture wick properly? No, you're not. You're looking to represent your team. What are you looking for the quality of the jersey? Either it's game worn or not, and that's a price point issue. Either it's official or not, that's a price point issue. But what is your dog in this fight? Everybody getting upset about these jerseys. The evidence and your fingers will decide. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter what we hear on social media in that enclosed atmosphere. It doesn't matter what the newspapers write. It doesn't matter what the players say. The only thing that matters when it comes to a uniform change or the unveiling of alternate uniforms, the only thing that matters is how many of them are being purchased. And that you can't escape from. Just so you know that tomorrow, Tuesday, we will be back live. In theory, I will be live, 2 p.m. local time from where the Olympics will be this summer, live Tuesday through Thursday, and then Friday, we'll have another mailbag. I appreciate your questions extremely. Go to davidsampsonpodcast.com, check out merch, check out our website. If you're in the New York area, there's one more show on the tour before we announce some other dates, and that's April 29th in New York City. You can even check out the quality of our uniforms because it's just business. See you tomorrow live.
This is nothing personal. Thank <laughs> you.